So I am joined today for yet another Progress Network conversation with the estimable, hard word to say estimable, but it's appropriate in the case of Parag Khanna, the inimitable, the passionate and persuasive and perspicacious. We're just going to keep going with the eclectic adverbs because it fits. I'm not going to stop you. Thinker. <laughs> of the world, who uh, is a citizen of the world more than most of us, literally living in Singapore, has lived in Germany, has lived in the United States, Asia, Southeast Asia, you name it, Parag has been there and is one of the more unusual global thinkers. Um, not a huge set of humans, global thinkers, but Parag is at the apex of that particular pyramid. And his recent book, Move, the forces uprooting us is out in uh, September in the United States. I think it's already out in other parts of the world. Correct. Mm -hmm. So if you are of other languages or other countries, you can already obtain it. Um, so Parag, in many ways, this recent book is part of your own continuum, right? Of thinking and your own continuum of thought of what's the world we're living in and what's the shape of it going to be from a 30,000 foot level and then finding the connectivity an idea mm -hmm. you've also written about um, at that level in a way that the noise of the moment usually obscures. And mm -hmm. it's striking, and I'm sure you are aware of how striking it is to be publishing a book called Move about the mobility of human beings on the planet as being one of the driving forces of the 20th into the 21st century. And then, as you predict, a driving force of the next decades. There is some irony of coming out with a book like this in the middle of a, if not the middle of, at, at the hopefully the tail end of a year and a half plus when movement uh, reversed and stopped and halted. So maybe talk about that as, you know, the tendency of human beings, at, which we did at the beginning of the pandemic to say, this is it, globalization's done. Mm -hmm. We're finished, kaput, we're back to renationalizing borders closed, some weird version of the pre-19th right. century. And in many ways, I think you disagree with that. But but talk about the kind of the oddity of this book at this time in a good way. Mm -hmm. It's been odd in a good way, because I think that the this ironic moment, as you rightly describe it, has actually been a perfect time to stop and take stock of where we've come in terms of human geography and the grand migration story of our species. Um, and I do go back 100,000 years to point out that we have been for the vast majority of our time as Homo sapiens, you know, colonizing the continents, we have been nomadic only in the last, uh, you know, 10,000 years did we become ever so slightly more sedentary. And then particularly in the last couple of millennia, for those of us who live in, of course, you know, modern societies with stable climates and so forth. But the last ice age, the retreat of the last ice age, only allowed us to, um, you know, become more settled in agriculture and so forth over the last 10,000 years and so on. And, you know, most people know that story. But just to remind everyone that, you know, it is not abnormal for humans to be nomadic. It's part of who we are. Now, I'm not actually advocating for or, or you know, sort of prescribing or predicting 8 billion people suddenly becoming nomads again. But mobility will be our destiny, which is sort of one of the punchlines of the book, for many reasons. Um, and they're very concrete. This is not an abstract book by any stretch. It's sort of, you know, bottom up and top down as I try and do things. It's reported from a lot of the places that I've been going to and have gone to recently. Um, and it seems to me that despite the pandemic, if you look at the data from January 2020, just as we were hearing about COVID, we actually had just gotten in the full 2019 data on human mobility. And as it happens, it was the, uh, the, the, the sort of maximum number of people that have ever crossed borders in a single year did so in 2019, 1.5 billion people. Now, that's not all going to come crashing to a halt simply because of COVID. Now, if you break down the actual reasons, the, the tangible material driving forces of people moving from place A to place B, in my assessment, every single one of them is in hyper overdrive. Uh, so again, it may seem temporarily paradoxical that people just stopped, you know, and the lockdown was truly the single most coordinated action on a global scale in the history of the world. 
But that said, yeah, and I mean, that's a really like a vital point, which yeah. many of us made at the time that the pandemic, certainly for X number of months in 2020 was the first ever full stop simultaneously experienced in real time human crisis. Exactly. Uh, you know, right. World War II doesn't even come close because it touched a lot of yeah. the world, but also left a lot right. of the world untouched. And response to crisis, right? Yeah. Whether by coordination or, you know, sort of in a way as a fait accompli, you know, countries decided to, you know, in a copycat way, begin to close down, close borders, have lockdowns and so forth. So it didn't happen through supranational imposition. It happened through this process of just this sort of neospheric kind of coordination and common sense, a brief moment of common sense. So we will not handle the great reopening and the, and the next great migrations of humanity with anything like that degree of coordination or precision, because, of course, the one sacrosanct area of sovereignty that remains, the last vestige, if you will, of sovereignty is control over who gets to cross the border. You can't control pandemics, can't control cyber attacks, can't control, um, you know, many aspects. You, you can, many countries, you know, don't have real sovereignty over their monetary policy and so on and so forth. The one thing left is who comes in and who comes out of your borders. A lot of countries don't control that particularly well either, but you could say that uh, that's that's the common denominator of sovereignty that remains. And I don't think we'll have ever a global migration compact or anything of the sort. However, that being true, it is also true that the great drivers of human migration are, as I said before, in overdrive. So demographic imbalances, the gap between old and young is only getting worse. It's getting worse internationally and it's getting worse domestically because of low fertility. So you need young people. Political crises, right? So turbulence, volatility, refugee, uh, you know, civil wars, international conflicts, whether it's Afghanistan, Syria, Sudan, you name it, you know, Central America, no shortage of those. Economic crises, right? In the last, um, just taking the last decade or so, that people being pushed or driven from the rust belt to the sun belt, from Southern Europe to Northern Europe. We are in a way economic migrants in terms of the number of people who moved in the 20th century to take just that one period of time. Economic migration was a far larger number than say even political refugees. And of course the 20th century produced a hell of a lot of political refugees, but by and large actually, and this is one of the positive points, is that we have achieved a world of enormous volume of human mobility, largely peacefully, right? Largely in a stable, gradual way. Otherwise, we would not be the immigrant societies, migrant societies, in many cases, melting pot societies that we are. So when people posit a future of mass migration that is somehow a barbarians at the gate scenario, aren't they kind of forgetting that we have gone through more than a century of mass migrations across the planet. Actually, the 18th and 19th centuries are also centuries of mass migration. The 19th century was the century of nationalism, many people say. It was also the century of mass migrations. And people posit these forces as if they're opposites, and yet they've always gone very much hand in hand, one often causing the other. And I'll, you know, we can come back to that later in terms of how populist nationalism drives people away, which is itself an emigration. And then again, you know, technology. So Labor automation in one place forces people away because factories close. Remote work and digitization is another kind of technological intervention that allows people to move anywhere they want. So you and I could be in Panama or the Bahamas or wherever we want right now because we are work we work in the services industry, so to speak. And lastly, climate change. I, I managed to come this far without even mentioning what has been for the last 10,000 years or 100,000 years and will be for the next thousand years, the biggest driver of migration, which is shifting climate. So again, final point on this, you don't get to pick your crisis or your driver. They're all happening at the same time. Do you remember a year ago during the lockdown, people said, oh, look, the people in Punjab, province of India can see the Himalayan mountains, which they couldn't see because of smog. So maybe we'll just tackle the pandemic now. And this is our way of tackling climate change. It's like, and then we'll come back to the economy and unwinding the stimulus the year after that. No, that's not how the way the world works. Although I also every thought crisis that. slamming you at the same time. And that's going to be the world that we're going to be in. So again, every driver of migration is an overdrive. So sure, an ironic moment to be talking about it, but a great time to be forecasting that this is upon us.
I, I felt at the time when that w was one of the headlines, you know, the people in northern India could see the Himalayas for the first time in X years because of the pollution, because the factories were shut down, was a, a really a mixed bag observation, right? Because in order to have a good view of the mountains from far away, uh, tens of millions of people were sort of thrust yeah. out of a very precarious foothold in, in the lower middle class, whatever we're going to call it, back into complete subsistence poverty uh, with very little help from the state. And I'm not sure that was a trade off worth making, um, which is a whole other question about pollution as a derivative of growth, as a derivative of a rising middle class, which creates climate change. But on the same flip side, it creates a more viable living than the subsistence living that the people who yeah. would much rather not see the mountains and much rather eat. Um, yeah, your life expectancy may not go up just because the air is clean if the economy is collapsed at the same exactly. time. So, you know, so the devil's are, advocate but... pushed back to some of what you're saying. And while I am not personally probably in that camp, uh, nor would the Progress Network be in that camp per se, would be migration was all fine and well when the world was more fluid. Europeans were conquering, the maps were being redrawn, populations were being either uprooted or conquered or eliminated uh, genocidally, but nonetheless, there was massive population on the move and a lot of demographic growth from a billion people on the planet in about 1800 to, I guess, close to 8 billion now. And that entailed a lot of movement and a lot of internal movement within societies. We're kind of at the end of that demographically, which you've alluded to. So whatever's going to happen from here on is likely to be a reshuffling of a static and declining population, not a where do we put more bodies. And then because there's a staticness and that challenges economic growth, any mass movement of people that has been far less than we saw in the periods you just talked about, meaning far less than the 19th and 20th centuries, has proven politically unbelievably destabilizing. It only took 2 million Syrian immigrants to rejigger a lot of the politics of Central and Western Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, Western as well, but more Eastern. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a lot of Mexican, Guatemalan, Honduran immigrants trying to get in to the southern border of the United States, far fewer than, than were legally coming in 20 years ago to create a political crisis. So yeah. that would be the, the devil's advocate pushback, which is even less movement of people in a world where there's a perception of a zero sum and shrinking economic pie is much more disruptive. Even high skilled labor, right? HP1 visas in the United States and the whole controversy of that, which used to be come, come, you know, bring us your talented yeah. is, is question. So let's not, you know, first of all, let's distinguish between intensity and volume, right? Like you say, in, it, when it comes to Syrians, um, in, in Europe, it was a particular intensity, not the volume, right? So Germany letting in, you know, close to a million total refugees over a one and a half, two year period was a problem of intensity, not of volume. Germany can absorb that number of migrants. Germany's census about four or five years ago was off by nearly 3 million people that they had previously overshot in terms of even knowing the population of Germany turns out to be smaller by several million than we thought, right? So, you know, all of Europe could use more people. They don't have an immigration problem. They have an assimilation problem. Right. So the rate, you're saying it's the rate of change was the issue, not the, not the, the quantity. Exactly. That's right. And, you know, and when you look at, again, and the, the variance in terms of the political impact, not surprisingly, is in some ways an inverse proportion of the size of the country. So when you're talking about very small countries, they're, you know, obviously, uh, by, by nature, going to feel overwhelmed. That said, it's not like a lot of people who are migrants from, from you know, Arab countries or, or other, you know, impoverished parts of the world want to settle in Hungary per se. So you can't really blame the Syrian refugee crisis for Viktor Orban, right? There's factors, you know, endogenous to these countries and their politics um, that, and of course the immigrate Im migration crisis is just an excuse for many of them. Then here's the good news, because this is the progress network. Uh, you know, the good news is that let's look at where the politics is today, you know, a couple of years ago, we thought that the AFD party was going to be a systemic force in German politics. Well, there's a German election right now, and the AFD is nowhere to be seen. 
um, Trump is out and H-1B quotas are going to expand. And not only are H-1B quotas going to expand, but the right to work for spouses of H-1B holders will now be allowed. So you will have even more chain migration will normalize the status of, you know, more than 10 million undocumented migrants in the United States. The most recent U.S. census that just came out shows just how much more diverse the American population has become. So we will look back and actually say that from a demographic standpoint, Trumpian, xenophobic populism in terms of its impact, not on national culture, which is a fairly traumatic episode, no doubt, with long lasting consequences, but on net inward migration figures, pretty trivial. Let's look at Brexit. It is easier to migrate into the United Kingdom right now in 2021 than it was in 2015 before Brexit. So you might ask yourself, well, what was that all about then? Because once they realized that they had labor shortages across the board, including crucially in the NHS medical sector, they realized, oh my God, we actually really need to bring in people of all stripes. So right now, you know, whereas five years ago or, or after Brexit, you'd have to pay a security bond and show a proof of employment in the UK. Now you just have to be a graduate of anywhere and they'll let you in. You need to have a pulse, right? And you can get into the UK. So let's be clear that supply and demand always wins. You know, I want to be clear about this because actually in the beginning of, uh, you know, our conversation, you mentioned globalization and people saying, well, you know, people are saying this is it, renationalization. Okay, well, I'm like old enough to remember 9 11, uh, the financial crisis, Trump and Brexit, and the pandemic. Four times in my short conscious span of, you know, studying this stuff, have people proclaimed with great confidence, trumpeted from the rafters, this is the end of globalization, this is retrenchment, this is backsliding. And they've been wrong every single time. So please, everyone, spare me your anti-globalization, you know, kind of a so-called analysis, because it's nothing of the sort. Globalization is a lot bigger than all of us, and it's a lot bigger than the individual, you know, pick your favorite metric that people trot out when they want to uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, sort of undermine uh, the pro-globalization thesis. So I wrote a, I wrote a piece in uh, a, for the Wall Street Journal in March of 2020, three weeks into the lockdown, hmm. saying, don't bet on the end of globalization. So make, making the argument you made, and also even yeah. then making the argument that what you've had over the past couple of years, the pandemic years, has been a cessation of human movement to some degree, but no particular cessation of goods and services movement. So uh, and maybe talk about you that a bit got too. China's you... trade surplus data, right? I mean, incredible, yeah. uh, you know, for the month of August, that's one data point. But yeah, the resilience of global goods trade, the surge in digital trade, um, and many other, uh, you know, sort of variables. Of course, you know, uh, capital flows also really crucial as markets open up further, capital accounts liberalized to bring in more investment. Um, you know, even if trade had not rebounded, I would have said the following, trade is billions and finance is trillions, right? Mm -hmm. So at the very least, if you want to make commentary on globalization, please don't use trade as your, as your sort of key variable. Right. No, but it's worth using as a variable given it supports the overall, it's just not the crucial variable. It is right. one amongst a lattice of variables. Talk about the digital for a moment, because that's a different kind of move. And you, you know, you do get into this. So there's the movement of humans, the bodies in motion, which is kind of the core of what you're talking about. But a lot of what you've a lot of your work over the past decade has also been about the connectivity of the digital, right? The connectivity okay. of the, the non bodies in motion, this connectivity, this kind of conversation, this process of a public conversation, however public this conversation between you and I becomes, but which will then end up in the ether and then heard and listened and experienced by people in various nodes of the planet um, right. who are not going to congregate physically, but are congregating in every way, intellectually, right. virtually, yeah. you name it. And this ethereal globalization is just because it's difficult to quantify, it doesn't mean it doesn't, doesn't exist or have value. It has an immense value. And the better our economic you know, methodologies get 
at un unraveling, you know, cloud-based digital services work, the more we'll appreciate the value of, of uh, digital globalization. Um, and we're getting there, you know, I mean, some parts of it will remain forever. You know, I, I call it quantum in nature, right? Because you really have, um, you know, you basically have uh, forces at play that are that that are completely global and in the cloud sort of, you know, and, and are, are ever present everywhere at the same time, you know, it's a Spotify problem, right? In in economics, you might say so, you know, Spotify is downloaded in one country, the revenue is booked there, the trade data, the money is not repatriated to Sweden. So it's not going to show up as a international trade or sale cross border in, in anyone's trade statistics. And yet it's an essential part of globalization. GitHub, where so much of the world's coding is done, is a cloud-based platform. And every video game you play was coded by collaborative teams that will never physically meet all over the world. Hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, the value of a whole bunch of gaming companies is bigger than Hollywood rests on this and so much more and more. And then of course the intangible value of being able to go online and learn a language, uh, you know, just by Skyping with someone and never needing to even travel there if you can't afford to or otherwise. So all of that, but that does rest on a kind of physical globalization too, which as you know, is the whole point of my connectography book was, you know, connectivity is a physical thing. You know, everyone says, oh, you know, what, what do you mean by, uh, you know, infrastructure? I'm wirelessly connected. It's like, okay, wait a minute. Internet cables, right? You know, highways, railways, oil pipelines, electricity grids, all that stuff. The, that investment and that build out of capacity is very much evidence of physical, you know, functional globalization, you might say as well. And we continue to do lots of that. I mean, out here in Asia, there's a new internet cable being laid down from Singapore where I live or through various channels of the South China Sea uh, practically every six months, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, so, you know, again, just, just to emphasize that we're always enabling more mobility. The philosophical principle at work, of course, is entropy, right, in a way, you know, and, and uh, you know, if you're familiar with the work, I, I cite him very often, uh, Adrian Bajan, he's a mathematician at Duke University, he's written some great books like Design in Nature, and he kind of looks at you know, principles where, where sort of physics and math intersect and examples of how it plays out in the real world. And it's amazing, the, the, you know, if you could sum it up in one word, it'd be flow, right? Enabling of flow is almost intrinsically part of the design of systems as we build them to enable entropy. And that is a process that continues. So do you find in, in the kind of the, the world we're in, there have been certain places and Singapore is probably amongst the key that looked like they had banked their future on physical hubs of connectivity, not virtual hubs of connectivity. Are you relatively sanguine about the physical hubs of connectivity in a world where it's not clear that business travel and, and that kind of interaction will indeed be what it was in 2019, as a lot of people reconsider the the pure utility, right, of how far for how long should one put your body in motion at what cost to what end? And if that, if, if, if the means can be achieved, if the means can be different for similar ends and cheaper and easier and less, you know, Right. environmental drain by international travel or domestic long domestic travel why not do things more virtually um sure. what does that do to some of these questions i wouldn't be saying about any place that was single sector you know non-diversified in its economic uh, composition as uh, singapore obviously isn't it's one of the most diversified economies in the world it's certainly the most diversified tiny country in the world uh you know you could cycle around it in a couple of hours as many people do every morning, um, but you've got everything here. So, you know, of course, physical connectivity, their port has been thriving actually uh, for the aforementioned reasons. Um, you know, it's a big cargo hub, aviation hub, but it's a, basically a services economy, real estate, dense population, you know, thriving internal consumption and so on. Other places, I, you know, again, um, if you look at just a, com you know, commodity, typical commodities dependent economy, um, you know, uh, oil or gas exporter with nothing else, you wouldn't necessarily be long on them given 
you know, what's happening with uh, the push towards renewables and the structural, again, what's happening right now is cyclical, structural decline in hydrocarbon uh, prices, um, even places that are physically, you know, sort of dependent on a certain infrastructure. So one of the things I've written a lot about is competition between ports. Um, you could extend the same argument to airports as well, of course, but ports are always competing with each other to be the principal hub and they undermine each other all the time. So I've written about you know, Val, the decline of Valparaiso in Chile because of the expansion of the Panama Canal, to take one example. Right now, King Abdullah Economic City on the Red Sea coast of Saudi Arabia is trying to develop to displace Jebel Ali uh, next to Dubai. So we always have this infrastructural competition going on. But here's what the interesting thing is. Again, it all comes back to flow and enabling mobility because what you're building is more capacity. You're building optionality. And when you build that optionality, you're building resilience designed into the system because you have multiple pathways. So when the um, when that ship got you know sort of lodged into the Suez Canal, right? Well, there was a reorientation of supply chains. You know, ships said, okay, some said, okay, we'll go around, we'll go around Africa. Others said, we'll go back and put stuff on trains because we built trains, because we have the Arctic routes and so forth. You have multiple pathways to the various destinations that you want to get to. That That is building for resilience. And that's a good thing. But is the capacity challenge the same in a shrinking global population? And maybe you have to go out 10 or 20 years so there are two ways to look at demographics in the 21st century. One is there is a sufficient number of people in India, in China, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, Philippines, you name it, Brazil, parts of even domestically in the United States who are not sort of where they would optimally either want or should be, right? A more stable, above subsistence, not one step or one bad health crisis or pandemic or job crisis away from tumbling back into bare subsistence. And therefore there's a lot of, even with a static world, there's a lot of growth from the bottom up, right? Uh, the, the, the bear case to that is you don't need more capacity for an aging population. You might need more healthcare capacity, but you don't need more goods. People do consume less as they age, even if lifespans go on for 10 years, I suppose that could change. But if, if more consumption is digital, particularly as you get older, then all this port capacity and all this stuff capacity will be slack. It will, it will show diminishing returns, not accelerating because of the world we're building for is not the world that we've emerged from. So right. where do you come out in that dyad or so, maybe it's triad or quadrat? I don't know which. I mean, there's a contemporary trap in the sense that we're, we have capacity shortages, right? Whether it is in you know, ports that are backed up for weeks and goods are, and food are rotting on those ships because the capacity is insufficient versus the potential scenario. And it's a likely one based on your, you, know, you and I pointing to these demographic futures where it will wind up being a stranded asset you know, and a dead asset and so forth underutilized. That's always happened, of course, right? Uh, you know, um, so plenty of barns and horse buggies, you know, <laughs> cease to be necessary with the advent of the automobile, such as life. Now, the, the, the stakes are higher. We're spending trillions of dollars a year on tomorrow's stranded assets, coastal infrastructure, oil and gas pipelines. And that's, that's the red ink on the books of, by the way, many state-owned Chinese uh, companies, uh, among, among others, uh, pension funds and so forth. So we do need to find ways to restructure that, write that down. And yes, could we get better at anticipating future dem demography and, the, of course, the geo-demographics, which is what this book is all about, where will people be in the future, and start to pre-design the kinds of settlements and habitats where people will be needed. So, you know, we look at tight agricultural supply and drought, you know, ravaging uh, Brazil and Australia and India uh, and even parts of the U.S., whereas, as we know, Canada and Russia, Kazakhstan, and other countries are becoming breadbaskets that are depopulated. Now, Canada is absorbing, you know, uh, 1% you know, a, a new population every single year. Russia certainly is not. I, uh, I, I write in the book about my travels through Kazakhstan and, and, uh, and, and Siberia and so forth. And I look at the kind of growing numbers of South Asian farmers in these geographies. 
uh, because Russia, despite you know Putin's rhetoric uh, against you know nationalistic, vitriolic, anti-immigrant, that kind of thing, the truth is that every other in every other part of Russia, except you know the sort of official Kremlin statements, they know they need people. I've talked to provincial chieftains, you know, across Russia who talk about their desperate desire for more workers. Um, I've talked to university heads, presidents in Siberia, who say we need to start teaching in English so we can compete to get Asian students so they don't all go to Europe and the US. So that's that's the ground I view. We need farmers, we need miners, we need infrastructure builders, all that. And they're actually getting that. They're just not even getting enough. Now, this is this gets to a really interesting point. Again, big picture, global. What will happen because of climate change and demographic imbalances and other factors is you're going to start to get new vectors of migration, the likes of which we haven't seen between regions of the world in our lifetime or or, it, or, or potentially forever. And a couple of the big ones that I write about are um, Asians to kind of uh, to Russia and Central Asia. So I call that the reverse Mughal Empire scenario. So 500 years ago. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the Mughal Empire expanded southward from the Fergana Valley uh, of Central Asia. Now you've got South Asians moving north. Um, and every time I'm in Central Asia, it's my favorite part of the world, you know, I encounter more and more and more South Asians, Indians in particular, who have settled there. And they are dentists, they are cooks, they are tour guides, uh, they are even school teachers because there are so many more international people moving and settling in Almaty, Kazakhstan, and they have to recruit Indians as English teachers. The second one, um, which you'll be more familiar with, is uh, is Western Europe. So when I was uh, in high school, I lived in Germany, and um, I was definitely the only person with my complexion who's not Turkish for a very in a very wide radius. Um, whereas you know today, I, I still go to Germany all the time, and I'm just blown away at how many so-called blue card holders there are, the EU's equivalent of the green card is the blue card, how many Indian blue card holder the, the holders there are working in the IT sector um, in Germany today. You know, SAP would not be functioning as Europe's largest software company if it weren't for all the Indians that you meet when you go to their uh, tech campus, their headquarters outside of Frankfurt. So Europe actually is going through this interesting process of absorbing more and more Asians, South Asians, Pakistanis, Indians, Bangladeshis, Chinese, Indonesians, Thais, Vietnamese, you name it, in ever, ever larger number. And that's something that's under the radar. So one of the predictions I have in the book is that, you know, I grew up as an Asian American. There are 25 million Asian Americans today. There are only 4 million Asian Europeans, excluding Britain, only 4 million. So I, I'm pretty confident that, you know, um, in the next 10, 15 years, you might have more Asian Europeans than Asian Americans. And to my knowledge, no one's tracked that data and made that argument. So I go to some length to spell it out uh, in the book. Yeah, with all these uh, villages in Spain and Italy sort of trying to woo people for exactly property for a dollar and improve it. Um, we'll see the, you point to this very interesting future also of a, or maybe a present of countries competing for people sort of holding out their shingle of, you know, please move here. The Russian one of how do we get people, how do we convince people that here is where you want to move? Because with mm -hmm. fewer migrants relatively, right. And more need there's, there's like an international market for, what what package can you offer that's most attractive to whoever it is who's going to relocate and and that's not a familiar I and mean, there's always been a little bit of talent competition but there hasn't necessarily been the kind of uh cutthroat competition for for people and bodies right like come here not there and this certainly uh you know sort of undercuts the notion of a global worldwide right-wing populist xenophobic shift doesn't it before the pandemic, how many countries could you name that had nomad visa programs? You know, right. probably Estonia. And today there's about 65 countries that have those programs because the pandemic hit precisely when people were complaining about toxic tourism and over tourism. And now it's like, okay, now it's the war for tourists. Please come because our economies have been decimated by not having tourists come. So, you know, again, globalization is one of those things that, you know, maybe you don't sufficiently appreciate till it's gone, you know, or at least temporarily. 
And this, though, is a structural one, right? It's countries saying, my goodness, if we don't sell our villages, you know, for cheap and bring in people, we are disappearing as residents in our own country. So Japan is like this, too. You know, people look at Japan from the outside and they see a country that's Galapagos, right? You know, insular, isolated, you know, uh, for, you know inscrutable culture. But there have never been as many foreigners living in Japan as today. And the number is rising and rising. And Japan, too, is liberalizing its immigration schemes. In fact, I'm hard pressed to think of a country in the world that isn't in the process of making it easier for people to go there rather than harder. Except for Pandemic China. Mainland China. Right. right, China, right. Pre but, but uh, you know, aside uh, from, you know, the pandemic restrictions. Now, here's the thing. This shock of the pandemic will obviously, the, 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 the brunt will be borne obviously by uh, Africa and South America with their low vaccination rates, lower connectivity, higher barriers to entry anyway, and so on. But for many places, and indeed eventually for everyone, I also, we can't hold all things equal. We're going to have significant evolution in the digitization of migration in the same way that we've had much progress in the dig digitization of everything else. So one of the sections of the book, I argue that passports should be on the, on the blockchain, right? There should be an app as your passport. And you upload to a secure blockchain, whatever credentials and you know, materials are required by countries, they tend to be fairly standard, criminal, financial, educational, other kinds of employment data, it's verified and you show it or it's accessed as needed and you're granted entry. And that's what countries will do to speed up the process of recruiting their future migrants. Well, Prague, we could talk for longer and we will, of course, talk for longer. But for this particular conversation, we are going to stop in the middle, which is good. And people will then have to go and read Move. And they should. Thank you. And they should. Um, and I want to thank you for being part of the Progress Network and keep spreading the word. Honor, the word simply being the kind of sensibility you bring to the work you have, which is we have a future. It will have a form and a shape. Um, the noise and much of the despair that animates a lot of Western societies uh, in the present is uh, as much a product of a particular moment in history and, and may not be a foretelling of anything other than the sentiment du jour, right? The, the feeling in the moment of things are changing in a way that I don't like, and then projecting that out negatively in the future. And you, of course, have been in, in have a different perspective given the worlds you've been in. Um, and I think I've talked for years about the view from Singapore or from parts of uh, Southeast Asia or Northeast Asia are rather different about the future, you know, much, much less dark, much more, we're going to build this and it's going to be ours, not theirs, theirs being the Western world. Um, but that's, again, the animating part of the Progress Network is let's spend more time looking at the future uh, that could be much, if not brighter than, than different in a good way than we think. And also what can we do to make that happen? And your work has always been a step back from the noise and hysteria of the moment to really say, okay, what are the larger forces at play here? Uh, and I think that's a vital, vital thing. And for a lot of other people, really vital because it is an awakening of, oh, right. There's a, there, there's more going on here than, than is Trump being elected or not, or is Brexit happening or not? You know, that there, there are larger forces at play than our daily dramas. Indeed there are very well put Zach. Thank you. Thank you, Prague. And please sign up, uh, Subscribe to the Progress Network feed on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. And uh, we will continue to have these conversations, an ongoing series. So until the next one, thanks. Mm -hmm.